got everything going. Good night. All right. One, two, three. Hey, man. Howdy, howdy. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I'm back. We're on the fourth step to revival here, the last step. And that is where everything comes together. This is uh, the first step, of course, was recognizing that we're not in that place in God that we're supposed to be. That's why we don't have revival. Recognizing there's no miracles, the power, the anointing is missing. Uh, the anointing is not great oratory. Okay, There's a lot of good preachers out there I love listening to, but the anointing is something completely different when the power just shakes the room. Souls are not getting saved at the numbers that revival uh, talks about. And then we come to a place of repentance when we realize that we have not been winning souls, and that is the very thing. The primary focus of revival is winning the lost, and that's the problem that we have not been doing, and that is why God has lifted His Spirit off the church. Third, we have to build a fire in the church before we start out, go out and get them. And we talked about that several, three, was it three different broadcasts? And now we're at that point. Let's Go get them. I, I want to build this point. I want to prove this point to you. First, let me, let's go to the word of the living God and ask the Lord to bless it in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to the living God. Pour out your spirit. Anoint and magnify and bless the reading of your word, Lord. And let our hearts hear, not just our ears, but our hearts that you may raise us up in revival in the name of Jesus. Encourage us, O God, with your word. Glory to God. I am reading chapter 2 of the book of Joel. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. It is close at hand. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. This is the battle call of God. Blowing the trumpet where? In Zion. This is a this is Zion is the church. Sound an alarm. Where? In my holy mountain. This is to us. This is to the church. In uh in Numbers chapter 10, verse 9, Moses made two silver trumpets. And when you blew an alarm on those trumpets, it was to call the people of God to battle. It is a battle cry. This is our battle cry. God is sounding an alarm, a battle cry to call to the church. It is time to go to war. The, the day of the Lord is coming. It's close. It is nigh at hand. In other words, this is supposed to be, this is a call just before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're like me, I, we believe we are in that generation. And I, I use this uh picture oftentimes to explain to people how close we are. Um, I believe that the beginning of the end time signs was when the Jews were restored to Israel, right? Jesus said, the generation that would see these signs come to pass would not pass away till all was fulfilled. You can look it up. Amen? Well, if that is the case, the Jews will return in 1948. That was 72 years ago. i got to ask you, how much time you think we got? Man, I'm 71, and I'm going to see the coming of the Lord. This is the generation. My generation is not this generation that God is talking here. This is the Gideon generation that is growing up that God is going to send this incredible revival to. We're going to read about that revival. I want you to know for sure of what's coming. All this work that I'm talking about and repentance and all this stuff, there's a purpose. It's real. It's coming. It is true. The greatest revival of all time is coming to this generation. We will see the greatest revival of all time. Because Joel here says it not once, not twice, not three times, six times. He time stamps this as a message for the last days. Yeah, we're living, we're living in that time. God calls us to war. 
And our weapons are not carnal, the Bible says. There's a passage in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14 that everybody's familiar with. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the word of God. Amen. We are soldiers and our weapons are, are the things of the spirit, the word of God, our righteousness, our power, our salvation. This is what we go to war with. This is what Satan understands. This is what defeats him. There has always been war between light and darkness from the beginning, and it has never ended, and it is a ferocious war, terrible war. The casualties are eternal. They're not like you get hurt or you get, you get thrown in jail and you finally get it. No, you lose in this war and you burn in hell forever. And the commission is unto us to go to battle for those out there and they have no idea where they're heading, but we know because our Savior has told us and he's commissioned us and he's empowered us and he sends us out with our weapons to go defeat the enemy. You, I mean, this is something. You, listen, if we're going to do this, if you're going to pray at that level, you need something to fight for you. You got to have a vision. You got to believe in what you're going. Remember, I said the sixth principle of revival is somebody's got to have a vision where you can see over the horizon. You can see what God has planned. You, you believe what it says. You may not be able to see it in, in the in the carnal world with your eyes, but you can see it with the eyes of your heart, and you believe God, and you enough that you will pick, pick up these bad, these weapons of war, and you will fight. You got zeal. You got something to fight for. You're on fire. This is the kind of prayer that we use to do this. It's got to be the kind of prayer crashes the gates of heaven. You are not going to have a revival with some little tiny wimpy prayer, your quiet time with Jesus over in a corner underneath a bushel. But you, I mean, you, God is calling for war. He's calling for a strong people. We need strong contending prayer of warriors who will agonize with tears and crying out to shake the very foundations of heaven for a move of God. That's what we need in these last days. This is what I've been talking about. This kind of faith, ferocious faith. Let me tell you something. And you know, I, I can't, I've said it before. If you keep doing what you're doing, you're not going to move God. You're going to have the same things you've always had. You know, you want to move God? Then you got to get out and move God. And if you want to move of God, you're going to have to move God. And prayer is what moves God. Not the wimpy prayer, but the prayer of warriors. There's a call in the Word of God that I, I consider the very blueprint of revival. It's in Joel chapter 2, verse 17. I want to read this thing. This is a call for sanctification and for total commitment before God. I mean, at this level. This is chapter 2, I'm verse starting re verse reading at verse 12. 12 through 14. Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn you even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn it to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, is slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repents him of the evil. Who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering into the house of your God. Amen. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Let's go. Quite gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. And let those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, the bride out of his closet. Let the priests, the ministers on, weep before the portion of the altar and say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and let not give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people that, that where is their God? That's what they're saying now. Where's your God? Where's the power that you're talking about? The power of God of salvation? Where is it? Where is that? Lord and God, we have to come to this place that he's calling us out for. Bring us to a place that is refined through the fire of this entire process that I've been talking about. From step one to step two to step three, here to this type of battle in prayer. This entire process, because this is what, it burns out all the other cares and desires that you might have. 
Nothing else matters. Give me souls lest I die. That's the cry, the battle cry of this generation. You know, power in God comes from a hard-won victory in the prayer room. And without that power, all that we got to show to the lost of this generation is a carnal self-righteousness that's devoid of the Spirit of God. And that will never draw them to salvation. Before we go to the streets, and I'm going to talk about witnessing, the battle has to be won in the prayer room. There is no battle that is won out there that is not first fought and won in prayer. This is what the call goes out. Before you go out there to go witnessing, this is the kind of prayer we have got to win this battle on our knees. Uh, we have to pray to make them hungry. We have to pray that the God will begin to deal with them and open their hearts up. That, 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 that they're hungry for truth and for reality. That, that they see that this, the world can't satisfy that innermost longing. We are the ones that see this and know this and have a reveal, this is revealed to us. So it is up to us to pray this thing in. We have to ask God to open their hearts, to make them hungry. Because I'm telling you, like I tell everybody, if, the fish, if you're fishing... And you got an expensive fishing pole, and you got the best bait in the world, man. You got everything. You're out in a boat or whatever the deal is. Let me tell you something. If the fish are not hungry, they are not going to take the bait. It don't matter how good it is. We have got to prepare the ground through battle type of prayer, contending prayer, storming the throne, not take no for an answer, wrestle God to the ground, and say, we, 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 demand a move of God. We will not move. We will not back up. We will not compromise. It is written in the word of God, and we hold the word of God up to him. It says, this is where your promise, you promised us, and we claim the promises of God. But I'll tell you something. It takes those four, three steps to bring us to that kind of a place in God where we can do that. But without that, nothing happens. And But when we do that, this is what happens. This is what he does. Kids, we call it, it's Joel's army. You know, I was going to talk, but let me read it. I mean, you got you got to read this. you got to hear this. This is the army that God is calling up in these last days. i got to move here quickly here. It said, then will the Lord be jealous for his people. Now, let me back up here. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, above, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there has never, ever been the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to many years of, uh, of many generations. In other words, these are the strongest Christians that have ever walked the face of the earth. Stronger than when Jesus was here, stronger than when Paul was here. It's what it says, it is written. Nobody's before or after these people, great and strong. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns, and the land's like a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing will escape them. These guys are on fire for God. Uh, the appearance of them is as horsemen. It's the kind of strength that they have. Like the noise of chariots, they're like a strong people set in battle array. These are warriors for God. These are, these are not... Oh, praise the Lord. How are you? Jesus loves you. That's no. Repent for Jesus Christ is coming back to earth. Make the crooked way straight. Prepare a path for the way for our Lord. Before their face, people shall be much pained. All faces will gather blackness. Why? Because they are so on fire that the light is so bright and darkness hates light. They'll run like mighty men. They shall not break their ranks. Neither shall they thrust one another. They shall run to and fro the city. They shall run up on the wall. They'll climb up on the houses. They'll enter in the windows like a thief. The earth will quake before them. And the heavens shall tremble. And the sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. What does that sound like to you? Those are prophecies of the last days. And the Lord 
Listen to it. It will utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, and he is strong who executes his word. Oh, I mean, I like, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. He is strong who executes his word. In other words, if it is written, God will bring this to pass. This is a promise of the Almighty God. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Man, that's that's cool. Man, that's cool. Where is this going? Let me show you the prophecy. We have a little bit of time. Let's go to verse 23. It says here, if we do all these things, right? There's the condition. If we, if with this kind of prayer and this kind of ferocious battle and we've repented, we have gone this whole process all the way to this point. Then he says, be glad, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord God. For he has given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. What does that mean? Excuse me. But if the former rain is Pentecost, and I believe that it is, Pentecost, man, it was powerful. Gave the church power to take the gospel around the world, right? But it's just it's moderate. Moderately, first rain. Let me tell you what's coming, son. He ain't just giving you the first rain. He can, he's giving the he's give you the rain, the first rain and the latter rain together in the in other words in the first month in other words it's going to pour it's going to pour and pour it is a second day of pentecost coming to the church far greater than the first one the greatest revival of all time this outpouring that Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 32, that, that when the, the, the day that the Spirit will be poured out upon us from on high. That's what this is talking about here. And the floors shall be full of wheat. The threshing floors of the church, where you bring the harvest into, they're going to be full of the harvest, full of wheat. And the vats will overflow with wine and oil. In other words, the, the spirit and the anointing, it will overflow. You're going to have services where you can't stand up. You can't sit down. You, you know, out, the Holy Ghost is pouring out. The preacher can't talk. And you'll be, the, I mean, you know, that's what you're going to see. I have seen this. I've seen this. Not only in 1970 in the Jesus movement in Africa. We saw it in Pensacola. I'm telling you it's coming far greater than anything we've had before because it is written because it is the word of the living God. That's what's coming. Time is up here. I want to come back with one more broadcast about witnessing. I want to show you some scriptures of why we got to witness and how about some methods of how to witness. How do we do that? Then? That's one of the biggest problems people have. They don't know what to do. We'll address all that in the next broadcast. This is Dale Garris with Fire in the Hole. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen.